Hey everyone, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in North Dakota. And honestly, the fact that we do actually hear from people in North Dakota on this channel, that's one of the ways that I know the word is really getting out there. North Dakota is looking super important for our climate future. The more we can spread word of the particular changes to expect on the ground in North Dakota, the stronger we can be. If you like eating food, you should care about this outlook. But before I get into the details, I want to give you some background about what's going on in the world of climate. You know, when I founded American Resiliency in 21 and started making these climate outlooks, I called them 2050 climate forecasts. Back then, it seemed reasonable to think that we wouldn't hit 2C until about mid-century. That was the consensus science. But that was then. 2023, as you know, having lived, it was a very serious year in climate. We hit 2C. You can see it for a couple of days towards the end of 23. We were over 2C in February for a few days too. 2023 was the first full year we spent over 1.5C and we still are. We can see that here. I switched over to the monthly average view. Both of these figures are from the Copernicus Institute, which is a high value source. That's the European Union's climate outfit. You can see here that the average that they're reporting for March of 24 was 1.68C and the April average was 1.58C. I'm glad to see that number going down a little bit from March to April, but you shouldn't think we're out of the woods or anything. And you can see from the data, anyone who tells you 1.5C is somewhere out in the future, they're just not up to date. So all that forces us to change our thinking. This outlook, it's a 2C outlook. As far as the timeline goes, it appears we're all going to find that out. Let's check the challenge level for North Dakota at 2C. And so you know where to find my source material. This outlook is based on high consensus information from the National Climate Assessment, which was just updated. We received the fifth National Climate Assessment in November of 23. You can find the figures right here. You'll go to chapters. You can go down to all figures. You can get all of them. Sometimes I also use information from the NCA Climate Atlas. NCA Climate Atlas is publicly available but the user interface can be a little bit clunky. We're very fortunate. We have a great team of volunteers with American Resiliency. AR volunteer Dustin pioneered this porting of the great NCA5 data into a more user-friendly interface where we can not only look at information that's in the NCA Atlas, but we can look at how different factors interact, like with this original wet bulb risk figure. These tools are pretty intuitive. A lot of them show what to expect at the county level at 1.5 and 2C. And you can see you don't even need to click. You can just pan over and get information from your county. I feel it's worth restating. No matter how we're playing with those publicly available data sets, it's important to know that Dustin's tool set there is based on the same great data as the NCA5 Atlas. It's just more user-friendly because I want you to be doing your research. I want you to be able to confirm everything I report without doing too much work on your end. And we are using that core NCA5 information because it represents the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this document, and you deserve access to the information. But as a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct federal funding for communication to the public about the National Climate Assessment. That made me so mad I founded American Resiliency. We're the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information to the public, and we run on your donations. Looking at a national overview for changes at 2C, you can see here in figure 1.14, North Dakota is almost entirely in the high change band to the north, looking at close to six degrees F in total warming. But let's see how that's gonna fall around the year. Let's go look at seasonal extremes in figure 2.11. Folks, let me tell you from an ag perspective, this actually just makes me wanna tear up. This is at a glance, wonderful news here. Look at that very limited spread of warm nights into North Dakota. Well, as we focus in on heat first, this is an important part of the story for North Dakota's bright future. Let's zoom in over here on daytime heat because you do see a fair amount of daytime heat up projected for North Dakota. This light color that we see mostly over here in Minnesota, but a little bit up by the Canadian border, that's maybe five days additional over 95. Here you've got 10 in the moderate color and there you've got 10 to 15 in that darker band. So you are talking about a fair amount of daytime warming but your nighttime warming, your nights that stay over 70, is less than five across the entire state. Regarding this increase in daytime heat, some places more summer heat means big drops in production. But here, your hot days, they were low enough before that even though this is a big change, even though you are looking at maybe a couple weeks over 95, I think your production will be all right. I think you're more talking about a longer growing season than talking about loss. 
Let's put this another way. Let's look at your increased wet bulb temperature risk profile at 2C. In this figure, it's worth watching the video about so that you can understand what the risk means. I think that it's important to see that in North Dakota, most of your risk at 1.5, which is basically where we are now, right, is unchanged at 2C. You're staying at a risk level 2, which is a very handleable condition with our current level of technology, a very solvable heat problem with our current level of cooling technology. And especially considering the fact that you have very limited increase in nighttime heat, you're talking about a great availability of passive heat solutions, low tech heat solutions. But what I think is important to talk about is we talk about an ag outlook, right? At 2C, this purple line here where we start to get into a wet bulb temperature of four, that's kind of the corn line that you're looking at there, where you're looking at the purple and red at 2C. That's the line where you're going to get big drops in production for your conventional staple crops. Corn, soy, other legumes are going to really take a dive in those purple regions. North Dakota is out of that danger zone. Let's go back to 2.11 and start talking about the cold. You can see here you're looking at about three weeks of cold loss, three fewer weeks of days below 32. You can see that that's more moderate than some other northern states if you look over towards the Pacific there. And I do want to get a look at your anticipated change in cold intensity. Let's go over to 11.3. So this is figure 11.3, and I'm really excited here, but I got to explain what's going on a little bit. So this is our present day contemporary type plant hardiness zones. This mid-century projection is at about 2C. You can see the 3 Cs readily available, but I feel like that's so far out. It's worth just looking at this next step, looking at just 2C. And usually I zoom in and I look just at the state, but North Dakota, I feel like you really got to see what's going on in a regional context as we look at this change. And it's it's good here. Well, let's get, let's get zoomed in. So North Dakota, we know your winters are like really cold, right? Like we're talking about getting into zone three, right? Three and four almost entirely. And you can see the change is big. You're talking about like a 10 degree lift in your winter lows in some of these places. But look at the zone you're moving into. You're moving into this dark blue zone, which is traditionally the highest production band zone. So if you're concerned about the agricultural future, if you're concerned about what's going to happen to ag production as we move towards 2C, we see this band where you have really good opportunities for natural pest control, for cold-assisted pest control, moving up into North Dakota. We're talking about a big enough change here. You know, you're going to have trouble with invasives. You're going to have landscape change. But you're moving in a really good direction, a really good direction for staple crops that are going to be negatively impacted. Their yields are going way down in so many parts of the country. Real sign of hope here for production coming out of North Dakota. So far, from an ag perspective, North Dakota is looking great. But what else do we need to live, folks, right? We need water. So let's take a peek at that in figure 210. So we can see this looks pretty overall good, the 2C, looking at up to 10 and 5% more water, but there's no cross hatching there in sort of that northwest quadrant of the state, meaning that trend's not going to be statistically significant. Could be a drought signifier. Let's switch to another view. And again, drought signifier just for that northwest quarter. Let's look at 4.3 and see if we can get more information from another detailed perspective. In 4.3, we see these increases expressed in terms of inches, where, as you'd expect, there's a continued climb in precipitation in North Dakota with more rain towards the east, a little bit less towards the west. This light color, we're talking maybe half an inch, whereas when you get towards the darker color, you're talking about maybe more like an additional inch of rain over the year. So we expect that to be the overall picture, more like an additional inch over in this side, probably more variability year by year in that northwest corner, relatively stable, fairly arid outlook in the southwest. Folks, I tell you, if you're in farm country now, we need you. So have been around on the channel a while, you know I'm very passionate about land stewardship and about biodiversity preservation, but you might imagine I also like people being able to eat, you know. When we look at my favorite part of the world, the growing stuff zone on the western side of the Great Lakes, we have some very important land choices to make, to think about how we can preserve productivity and ecosystem services while preserving biodiversity. I feel like we have such an important guide to those choices coming up right now in figure 2.12. 
A lot of folks who do work on the land, they may have heard another inch of rain. That probably means it's coming all at once, right? Like we're concerned now about deluge type rain in a way that we haven't been before. And this figure lets us look at projected changes to precipitation extremes at 2C. North Dakota, the only really conserved hot spot in terms of deluge type rain is up here in this corner with northern Minnesota. This area where you see a projection for very strong chance of frequent huge storms, folks may know that that's not really suitable for contemporary agriculture, right? You can't get machines out there. You're going to lose any inputs that you put on the soil. It's a big problem. So where we see repeating patterns across those figures and where we're seeing strong signals here for deluge type precipitation, it sucks for farming, it causes flooding, and it's where we need wetlands and prairie restoration on a large scale. You can see that whole line there by Wisconsin, the area on your border by Minnesota up by the north, the area near the Iowa-Minnesota border. If we put real big habitat restoration efforts into those areas, the flooding impacts would be cut substantially for our reason. Like we could be looking at increased flooding or we could not, depending on our land use change. Wetlands restoration is the easiest, most cost-effective path forward when we look at addressing the challenges facing us. Habitat restoration can help solve our problems without waiting for a technological breakthrough. And then we get the aquifer recharge and the ecosystem services that we need for pollinator services, for clearing the air, for helping to protect us against temperature extremes. It only requires a values innovation. Seeing ourselves as a region that has a future. Moving towards a future where we care about having a future. That seems to me like something the majority of us in that region find very meaningful. And when we talk about food in that future, it's very important to look at these light bands. Those light bands, they're ideal agricultural areas. The lightest bands there, we're looking at maybe taking a step backwards even away from the massive deluges we're currently experiencing towards gentler, more regular rains. These lightest bands, those include my community in Iowa. And I know that many of the farmers around here, they experience it as a religious calling, a calling of service to feed America. These light bands, if you're in that camp, you could see these as bands of light, man. Many people are gonna suffer from hunger in the years to come in ways many families in America don't remember. But my family remembers hunger. And when we consider the future, what we could have, that if we could handle our resources appropriately, we could feed America in the future that's coming. We should experience that as a gift. It is an incredible future that we see in our region that we could unlock with responsible land use choices here. And the guide to that is figure 2.12. You know, agriculture in America is going to change. Farmers and ranchers have a tremendous need to adapt to the intensely changing conditions they're experiencing around the country, and they need our support. The farmers I know, farmers that live and work on the land, they care about land stewardship. They care about healthy soil and healthy water. We need more people on the land, not less, to give the land the care it needs in this time of change, and we need to support our producer communities. They are making a big lift in this time of storms, and I tell you, North Dakota, this has been a wonderful time here, looking into the future with you for a minute. Because, you know, there's a great burden of stewardship on you alongside the realistic hope of good futures for your families. Looking at your place in the region, because, you know, our region is the best. We've got the capacity for a great future in this part of the world. We've got sustainable power from wind. We've got clean water. We've got great soil. And we've got great communities. A future worth building, a future worth living, and a future worth defending. North Dakota, you've got so much potential. You could ride this change potential like a wave of pure bright energy. And I wanna see you do it. Let's get ready. Thanks, thanks for watching. And I wanna thank everyone in the AR community for your contributions. They're keeping this nonprofit rolling and growing. If you wanna donate, there's a link on the about page of our YouTube channel or on the top bar of our website, www.americanresiliency.org. I'm very grateful to our donors, to our volunteers, to everyone spreading the word online and especially to everyone doing the work on the ground. As a special note, I'm on the lookout for a solid climate data set for Mexico. I think more and more of us are wanting a Mexico overview. If you've got a lead, email me at ar at Thanks for getting ready with me and talk with you again soon.